knowing my tendency to go epically over time, I think I might as well get started and we'll try to limit the damage if that's okay with everybody. Um, don't mean to interrupt great conversations and arguably we should not have so many people blathering at you so we can have more of them, but you know, I'll blather for, and meaning no disrespect to the previous speaker, <laughs> but uh, you know, me, I, I'm going to blather at you for sure. Um, I'll try to keep it short and interesting. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I, by the way, Jason, where's Jason? Yes. Excellent talk. That was awesome. I really, really enjoyed that. This talk's at a little different technical level and uh, so um, I'm going to try to keep it sort of in the range where everybody's comfortable. Uh, looking around the room, most of the people I know here are not going to have any trouble following anything I say. If you do, please don't hesitate to interrupt and ask questions. I, I really am not eager to go any faster than you folks want to go and we'll get through however much of it we get through in 45 minutes or an hour and then we'll call it good. Um, I don't have to cover every single slide just because I wrote them. <laughs> so I'm Bart Massey. A lot of people in the room already know me. For those of you who don't, I've been a professor at Portland State for the last 14 years, I guess. I can tell because my sabbatical is coming up here shortly. And uh, before that, I computed, for, did computing stuff for a long time. Um, and so I started writing C around uh, 1985, somewhere in that range. Um, 1984, it says on the slide. Sure, I'll believe that. Um, and uh, at that point, you know, that was, that's the hardware we have down there. That's a, that was actually the new hardware when I got to read. They were just replacing the PDP-1170 with a VAX-11785, which was just an epic machine. It was 32 bits and, you know, had, you know, like a megabyte of memory or something. I don't even remember, you know, like more memory than you could possibly imagine. And, uh, uh, big disk. And that, that box, I mean, there's no scale there, unfortunately, in that photo I found, but that's about the size of a, of a tall refrigerator and twice as wide. That's about two refrigerator boxes full of electronics. If you open it up inside, you'd find chips and wire wrapping on the back plane. It was, it was epic. So, um, you know, that's what computers looked like then. And so everybody cared about performance because, you know, everything was going to go only as fast as you could make it go on very, very slow hardware by modern standards. And so, of course, you know, your C code, you had to write in C. You know, actually, there was the big argument just finishing up about whether you were better off in writing in C or assembly, um, with the C folks finally winning when pretty conclusively 99% of programmers couldn't write as good of assembly as the C compiler could. And so that settled that battle. But, um, but there was still an argument going on, and that 1% still could. And really, you know, part of the secret to that is with the portable C compiler, you know, this is way in the pre-GNU C days, you were basically writing assembly code, right? You were writing um, old KNRC, and you could sort of, a, an experienced programmer could sit there and look at the VAX and look at the C compiler and go, yeah, when this is compiled, it will produce this sequence of machine instructions and be right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a simpler time. And by the way, um, those CPU instructions, they could then look and see, oh, okay, there's the VAX 11 machine instructions. Um, here's how long each one will take, because they all had very predictable lengths, and they ran in a very predictable way, in a very predictable order. None of this magic out of order or multi-AP, you know, none, nothing like that. And so you pretty much could look at your assembly code and go, oh, yeah, I know how long that's going to take. Woohoo! Um, that was a feature in a way, because it made it really easy to analyze what was going on. It was a bug in a way, because all those things, all those clever things that make it hard to analyze also generally make it faster. And on a modern CPU, you can never tell what the compiler is going to do, and then you can nev never tell what the CPU is going to do after that. Um, so here's an example of a problem you might care about if you're in that era and if you're in the era today, which is to say, okay, you know, for every number, and again, you know, I think most of you know this, but you know, for the few who don't, I'm going to take it real slow here. Um, so, you know, the word size in an old VAX is the same as the word size on machines up until a few years ago, 32 bits. We had a nice 25-year run of 32-bit machines. And um, in a 32-bit machine, you know, sort of every integer can be represented by a pattern of 32 bits. And for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't much, mu much matter how you do that. The important thing is to realize that there's a mapping between, one-to-one -one mapping between these things. And so if C in the old days had a, a B format for numbers, um, like it does hex, um, you would write it like that and you'd say, okay, so um, you know, the, 
the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight decimal is this long string of zeros and ones in binary. And you might be interested in, well, how many one bits are in there? I'll talk in a minute about why you might care why there are one, many one bits in there. There are reasons. Um, and so we call that the pop count or sometimes the Hamming weight, or sometimes there's a bunch of names in the literature. I'm going to consistently use pop count in this talk. Is just the number of one bits that are turned on in some integer, you know, in the binary representation of some integer. Clear enough? Everybody good? Nothing too fancy so far, I think. And you know, you can sit there and manually count them and see that there's 12 in that one, and you're like, okay, woohoo, pop count's 12. All right. And if you want to compute that for some given integer, which is a thing you might want to do. There's sort of, I, I, maybe obvious is the wrong word, it's almost always the wrong word to use, but there's the slow way. And to understand the slow way, you have to understand a little bit about bit banging, a little bit about C's notion of treating bits as a thing, which was unique to C, and everybody copied it because it turned out to be a really good idea for some things. But if you haven't seen it before, it makes your head hurt a tiny bit the first time you see it. So let's walk through this loop a little bit slowly and see what it's doing. And what we do is we take in the number that we're trying to pop count, and we set this thing to an initial pop count, this P to an initial pop count, which is the number of one bits that we've seen so far, which is none. And now, for each bit position, um, we're going to use these funny operators that are part of C that a lot of you have used, and maybe a few of you haven't. We're going to shift the number binary, you know, bitwise right by i places, you know, so first shift it right zero places, then one places, and so forth. Um, until, and in each one, we're then going to and it with one. And what that effectively does is it says, if the rightmost bit in our binary number is one, we, the result is one, and if it's zero, the result is zero. So we're going to just shift a bit down into the bottom position and then see what it is. And then we're going to take that result and we're going to add it back into our pop count. So we'll add zero on the times when we find a zero bit, and we'll add one on the times when we find the one bit. And so if you walk through this real carefully, you kind of see, yeah, okay, fine. When we're done, the, the end condition will be that P contains the number of bit, one bits that we saw, and we just return it. No real magic here, just a thing. Good enough? Notice the uint 32, well, uh, notice the typoed uint 32 t there that's supposed to have an underbar t after it um, both times. Sorry about that. Last second slides. Um, you should be using, if you're not, in 2014, the um, C types that come from um, int types.h that specify what your numbers are supposed to be. Because if you don't, you'll never figure out how many bits your numbers are. Int, C allows int to be pretty much anything. And um, C allows, for example, the right shift instruction on ints to either sign extend or not sign extend. There's all kinds of magic. Usually you want to nail this down as much as you can early. So I was pretty careful about how I chose this up to the part where I forgot to get the type name right. For the rest of it I was pretty careful about. So that's the, that's, the, that's the pop count. And why do I say that's a slow pop count? Well, because it's slow. Here's the deal. Um, each time through the loop I get to do an increment and I get to do a shift right, which if you're lucky, and on all modern machines you're lucky, will take one cycle. On old machines it might take as many cycles as you are shifting right because it didn't have what's called a barrel shifter that can do it all at once. But we'll assume we're on a reasonably modern machine. So there's one, two, three for the and, um, four for the add, and um, you gotta count something for the fact that we're going around a loop, let's say five, times 32 is 160 cycles. Now that's a little bit naive because modern computers don't, you know, like, like I say on the VAX, that would have been exactly 160 freaking cycles and there would have been no question. On a modern machine, um, it does all kinds of clever things. You know, it does branch prediction and it does running several instructions at once and blah, blah, blah. So it might be a little faster than that. But still, 160 cycles, <sighs> not so good. We'd like to do better. Um, because, you know, faster is better. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit about why we care. So, you know, there must be some way we can do better. And, you know, maybe I should say right now, well, what do we care about this for? Well, so for example, imagine somebody hands you a bitmap and you want to know sort of how dark it is, how gray it is. Well, it's a bitmap. So each bit in the bitmap represents a pixel that's on or off. 
And so I might want to average, which means counting the number of one pixels in my bitmap and then dividing by the number of pixels in my bitmap to get an average. Well, okay, I'm going to be doing a lot of pop counts. They better go very fast. Um, in machine learning, I might, for example, have something that represents the pattern I'm trying to see. I might have something that rep represents the pattern I saw, and I might want to compare how many bits are different. Well, if I XOR those two things together, it turns out I get ones every place the pattern and the and the two things mismatched. And now if I count the number of one bits in that result, woohoo, I now get to um, find out how many mismatches there are, which might be really useful. Again, I might be doing this over a very large pattern, lots and lots of bits, so I want the pop counts to go very fast. Um, in adversary searching games, if I'm building a chess player, is what that means. I might have a bitmap that represents how many different places pieces can move on the board, and I want to count up the number of moves because, in general, giving my opponent more moves is bad. Choices about where to move is bad. Giving me more choices about where to move is good. And so I really want to know, you know, what's going to be the result of this position, one where I have good mobility or one where my opponent has good mobility. Pop cap over the board bitmap. Board bitmap. There's also uses in crypto. I don't know about crypto. Somehow crypto people really like to have a fast pop count. You can ask crypto people how that works. Um, so that's just some of the places. This is a thing that matters. And so then the next obvious question to yourself is, well, why isn't there a pop count instruction? You know, why do I have to invent this at all? Why isn't there something just like right shift or bitwise and that's just pop count? And I sit there and say, well, OK, there's a pop count. Why doesn't C have a pop count operator? Well, C doesn't have a pop count operator because it's been pretty rare to put a pop count instruction in. It does happen. It turns out that modern Intel processors have a pop count instruction sitting in their SSE4. If you happen to have SSE4, which is the very, very latest and greatest SSE, you can pop count a 128-bit long thing with, pretty fast with that. Um, some of the older processors had it because loops were slow and other things were slow, and so you could actually make a difference. The secret is that the implementations of pop count that we're going to look at, the C ones we're going to look at, are pretty competitive with what the hardware can do. And so it hits at the heart of one of the secrets of you know, how you decide what instructions are in your instruction set when you're designing a computer. You don't put instructions in where the software can do it just as fast as the hardware could, more or less. And what we're going to see is that we're damn close with pop count. And so, so no, there often isn't a pop count. And the, C, the, the Intel normal instruction set, not the SSC instruction set, still doesn't have a pop count. So there we are. Good enough? All right. So we're going to play the pop count game today. Uh, we're going to play the pop count game for a couple of reasons. One is I want to see you know, sort of what it looks like to poke around and bit bang at things real hard. And I also want to do it because I want to talk a little bit about micro benchmarking. Um, because you know, if you're going to call your thing talk pop count in the black art of micro benchmarking, you've already taken a position. I want to talk about how you micro benchmark, why you micro benchmark, and then I hope part of what I'll persuade you is that most of the time you shouldn't micro benchmark because it's a terrible, terrible plan. <laughs> but uh, that's what we're going to be doing today is micro bench benchmarking to illustrate sort of the fun you can have with micro benchmarks. And again, you know, I'm going pretty quick. Don't hesitate to stick up your hand, and if that doesn't work, yell at me or whatever. So we'll slow down. So why do I hate micro benchmarks so much? What's my problem with micro benchmarks? Well, there's a lot of ways that micro benchmarks commonly go wrong that are really, really easy to fix. Um, but people do it anyway. And you'll just see these dumb things again and again and again. So um, let's go back a second to that little micro benchmark that we were looking at. So this is probably the dumbest possible way you can micro benchmark uh, pop count, right? You say, well, you know what? I'll run, um, what is that, 100 million times, I'll run pop count on zero. And then I'll get out my stopwatch, right? And I'll hit return on this program after I've compiled it. And I'll sit there and watch the stopwatch. And some number of seconds later, clonk, I'll get my prompt back. And now I know, you know how long it took to run it 100,000 times. Woohoo. Now I can divide by 100,000 and I get how many, you know, nanoseconds, how many seconds per iteration I get, which is probably going to be in the nanoseconds somewhere. Clear enough? That's a micro benchmark. Why do we call it micro? Because it just tries to measure this pop count in isolation. It doesn't, 
It doesn't measure anything, you know, how it would work in the context of a larger program. It doesn't, you know, attempt to provide any machinery about how you would use it. It's just like, no, we're just going to run pop count a bunch of times and tell you how fast it is. And there's a bunch of fail in here. The first fail is that we always run it with zero. I'm really suspicious that, you know, modern CPUs are kind of magic. I think I may have mentioned that. One of the things they like to do is optimize things involving zeros. And I'm really suspicious that that may not be a typical value to run pop count with, and it may go faster than it otherwise would. Yeah? Doesn't that always return zero? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Every time. I'm just running it to see how fast it goes. I'm not running it to find out the answer, right? So second problem, which I think is what Ward's smelling something suspicious about, and he's absolutely right, um, I'm not actually using the result of the pop count anywhere, right? And so what's my C compiler really happy to do for me at that point? Anybody? Get rid of it. Get rid of it altogether. Wow, I hit return it, it just comes back. I'm like, wow, well, I didn't run it enough times. Let's try running it a billion times. Oh, look, I just hit return it, it comes back because the whole loop's been optimized away because I didn't use the output. Um, like I said, this is an easy problem to fix, but you got to remember to fix it. And I've seen people fail before. And usually it isn't this bad. It isn't that it optimizes the whole thing away. What's worse, right, is it optimizes part of it away. It sits there and says, oh, look, you're always calling pop count on zero. So let's go back there. Oh, look, you're always anding with zero. And so I can optimize that part away. And you'll end up with this sort of half of a pop count implementation because the compiler's clever, clever. And um, it'll go really fast, Which unreasonably, crazily fast. And you need to run that to get your baseline. And that's your baseline measurement. No, I'm not going to run it quite like that. I'm going to show you how I run it to get my baseline. You're right. This is my baseline measurement is to do something like this, but with the dumb pop count we just wrote. But I want to be really careful to run it in ways so that the optimizer, I need to run it with the optimizer because I don't care what the unoptimized speed is. For pity's sake, if you care about performance, you're going to turn the optimizer on, right? And I need to run it, um, I need to run it and make sure that sort of I get typical pop count numbers back, whatever, you know, Pop, pop count arguments, whatever that means, and I need to make sure that I use the results so the optimizer will not throw any computation away. And so, so you're assuming that you run benchmarking with optimization only. Oh, I do. For this, yeah, if I care about performance, absolutely. I mean, you can run it with, with it off, right, which does make things epically easier just to find out the difference between unoptimized and optimized code. But at the end of the day, what I care about, if I care about something enough to write it in C and tune it for performance, then I want the compiler to do the best thing it knows how to do. I not only run it with optimization, I spend a bunch of time screwing around with optimizer flags going, oh, I wonder if, you know, oh, look, the comp I wonder if we can make the code go faster by telling it more or telling it less or this or that. Absolutely. Instantly. Absolutely. And so that's what I don't want, right, is that at the end of the day, I want it to be, reflect something realistic and sort of inherently Micro benchmarks don't do that. So I might not test over enough of the domain. I might lose control of the optimizer that goes off and does something I didn't expect it to do that isn't really fair, um, doesn't really give me a good comparison. I, it's really easy to lose precision in the measurement. Um, so you know, a lot, of, a lot of things when you're trying to micro benchmark them have significant inter-run variation, for example. So if you only run them once, like I was doing there, uh, not so useful. I probably at least better get it out, run it five times, and then figure out what kind of average or maximum or whatever I'm going to use for the statistic there. Um, and the other thing that's really easy is if my pop count was broken, and obviously I haven't ever compiled it because it wouldn't have compiled, um, I'm never going to notice. And it's really, really easy to spend a lot of time tuning a piece of code, and then when you've got it going really fast, find out that it doesn't actually work. These are all easy problems to fix. And the benchmark framework I'm going to show you that I built for this problem fixes all those. Um, those none of those should really be a problem for you because pff, they're all easy to fix. You just have to pay attention. Um, so if that was the only problem, I would be all rah, rah, micro benchmarks. Um, here's the hard ones. Um, First of all, what does it mean to give realistic arguments? What does it mean to run it in a realistic setting? On a modern machine, and we'll run into this later on, on a modern machine, everything interferes with everything else. And if I'm just running, you know, there's no situation in which I'm just running pop count over and over very fast. At the very least, I'm fetching some values to pop count from memory or from a register or from something. At the very least, I've got something that interprets the output of the pop count in some way. And so unless I provide a realistic environment like that, you know, a realistic amount of memory, a realistic whatever it is I'm going to do, um, you know, a, a machine that's like mine, then these numbers are completely meaningless. 
they're fun, but they're completely meaningless. Um, and again, it's really easy to make the code environment sensitive so that you know, very small changes. Oh, yeah, I run it and it shows that it takes eight nano, you know, 80 nanoseconds and then I run it again and it takes 40 nanoseconds. What happened? Well, there was a process running in the background or you know, your, your cache was not warmed up yet or some horrible thing like that. Um, and of course, the other thing people do, because it's impossible not to, is that after doing all this fail, they then really make it important a little 1% difference, right? There's a fundamental rule that I like that most people don't seem to either buy into or even understand, which says that 0.1% of a huge amount of time or money is still 0.1%. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you can spend your whole life chasing 0.1%, but here you're not going to likely find the right 0.1%, A, and B, it's only worth so much to go chase them. If I could give you a pop count algorithm 20 pages long that involved understanding group theory or, you know, or something that gave me a 1% speed up, I would never do that to you. I'd never touch it because who cares? Right? So um, these things are harder to fix. And the net result of all that is that you know, usually when you see a micro benchmark, you can just write it off as a near meaningless comparison between things that shouldn't be compared. And so why am I wasting your time? Why am I giving you an hour talk about a micro benchmark about pop count? Well, because I want, to, I want you to see how this stuff all plays out in practice. And because the larger difference is you can draw some gross conclusions. I mean, I am going to justify at the end of the day, for example, the conclusion that that first thing I showed you is really, really slow. And so I'll talk you out of using that and show you some things that are a little bit, that are enough faster that they're worth a tiny bit of extra confusion. So here's my situation. I, need, I, I needed a pop count for XCB, this X library I was writing. I don't even remember why now. I needed it for some functions that I was writing inside there. I think counting open file descriptors or something stupid like that. And when Keith P. wrote X11 um, back in the late 80s, he put in, um, he used a pop count algorithm he got from HackMem 169, which is this cool MIT memo from the old, old, olden days about clever things you can do. And it had this pop count algorithm that was about seven lines of PDP-8, no, PDP-6 assembly code that people eventually translated into C. And it's immensely clever to the point where when we see it, I won't even try to explain it very well. And it's faster than the dumb thing. And so it was the first thing he saw, he grabbed it, he stuffed it into X. I'm like, nah, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. I, I want an algorithm, you know, so here's my goals. I wanted something that was reasonably fast. And by the way, reasonably fast in the worst case, not in some average case or in the best case. I want something that will work anywhere, that's really portable and that's performant, reasonably portable performance. It'll be fast any place I run it. We'll talk about some that aren't. And I want it to be simple enough to understand and to maintain that Anybody who looks at it can figure out what the heck it's doing and how it works with a reasonable amount of time and effort. So those are my goals. And so I did what you do when you're a software engineer and you want to do this, right? I went off and found a bunch of pop count algorithms, did a survey, and then I microbenched them all to see which ones were fastest. Not really. I wanted to see which ones were fast enough, and that's an important distinction. And what we'll see is that a lot of them are fast enough. And besides, the other problem with microbenchmarks, by the way, and I was caught in that today, is that when you start micro-benchmarking, it's very addictive, very time-consuming activity. You're like, woohoo, I'll bet I can make it a little faster. And today I got this out to give the talk again after you know, leaving it for years and years and years. This was like 2007, 8, 9, by the way. This is a long time ago I was doing this. I got it out again today. I'm like, wait, I bet I can make it a little faster if I do this. And so I'm writing more pop count algorithms and benching them. Woohoo. Um, very easy to just have it take over your life long after you should have gone and done other things. So you can find all my code. All, everything I'm going to show you today is on my GitHub at PopCount in the surprising location of PopCount. And so it's all under an open source license. You can pull it down. You can look at it. You can run it yourself. I actually, one of the things I didn't have time to do is to run it on any machines other than my Intel machines I had lying around. It would be really nice if somebody would run it on a Raspi or some kind of ARM machine and tell me you know, if the conclusions we drew on Intel hardware hold it all in that sort of older environment. Um, so the key idea here is bit parallelism. We've already talked about it a little bit. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because I think it's such a cool idea. And if you ever have to do parallelism, um, then 
This is the kind of parallelism you want to try to get first because it's on every computer ever built. On a modern computer, you have 64 little one-bit computers that are all running at the same time and it's not a bad way to think of your CPU. And they can interact with each other. You know, when you do an addition, there's the carry bit which not notionally fl flies from left to right well, from right to left, sorry, across the addition, right, which is how the little one-bit CPUs communicate with each other. Cool. So you have this parallel machine and 64-way parallelism, that's pretty epic parallelism. You can't go out and buy a machine with 64 CPUs for any reasonable money, but you can buy one with 64 bits for peanuts. Woohoo! So we're going to use the parallelism this bit parallelism to try to make our pop count go faster. That's the essential plan. It's been the essential plan since Hackman 169 in the 60s and it's still the essential plan today. And if you want to do that kind of stuff, or if you're interested in any kind of bit banging at all for whatever reason, you simply have to buy a copy of this book. This is the bit banging book. And if you take nothing else from this talk, take it that if you're going to work in C or assembly and you want to bang bits, you, you need to buy this. There's a second edition out now, which I'm just reading today. Um, but I, I worked from the first edition. There, it's, it's epic. It's got everything in it. And really well written, really well organized, and just full of cool things. Um, so. Here's a good example of the bit parallelism. We already talked before about you know, sort of differences of bits. So if I XOR two numbers together, um, then you get a one bit every place they're different, and you get a zero bit every place else. Now I want to find out, do the numbers differ in exactly one bit position? I've got my little parallel computer. I've got my bit, bit parallel computer. What am I going to do? Well, I'm first going to check to see if the number is zero. Because if it's zero, they certainly don't differ in exactly one bit position. They differ in zero bit position. So I'll rule that case out first. Let's assume that passes. Now I'm going to do this, which falls into the category, I think, of non-obvious things to do, right? If you stare at that for about an hour and write stuff on a piece of paper and this and that and the other thing, or at least that's how I did it, then you start to realize that what's going on here is this actually um, the, the subtraction necessarily clears the lowest bit in the number because you know there's a borrow that goes on here. You're, you're going to sit there and you're going to get one bits all the way up to where the first non-zero bit is, right? Sorry, I keep going the wrong way. You're going to get one bits all the way up to where the first non-zero bit is, and then that bit will become a zero, right? And then after that, the number will stay how it was because you don't need to borrow anymore, right? And so because of the borrowing, I get this bit mask on the left, I get the number, and then I get identical bits on the other side. Now I'm going to apply this AND. Well, the AND, you know, we don't really care what it does on the low order bits because they were all zero anyway. And on the first one bit, you know, th that's now a zero, it will clear it. And then the rest of the bits, um, it it will leave the way it was, so it will, remove, it will have removed exactly the lowest bit from the number. Ooh, that's interesting. So after I've done this operation, the result of this operation will be A except with its lowest bit turned off. Oh. So if it had exactly one bit, it will now be zero, and I'll get what I want. Otherwise, it must have had more than one bit, and so the answer should be false. Clear enough? By the way, that's the basis of a very famous pop count algorithm that nobody uses anymore, Kernighan's pop count. He says, well, um, if, you, if you want to find out the number of bits in the number, just keep killing the lowest bit until there aren't any more and count how many steps it took. Right? And that's really great if you're looking at a number that's very sparse. right? If the number is 0, it works right away. Or if the number of bits turned on is 1, it works right away. If the number of bits is turned on is 32, this is just an expensive way to do that slow thing we saw in the first place. Of this bit parallel computer that you've been handed that you didn't even know you had maybe, right? That's, that can do things in parallel, really parallel. Um, and does them really scarily fast, as we'll see. So here's the key idea behind basically all the other pop counts. It's the, it's, sorry, this slide's really tiny. I, don't, I hope everybody can see it in the back. Um, it's kind of an important slide, so I don't really know what to do. Uh, I should split it onto a pair of slides or something. I guess you can always move to the front. There's plenty of empty chairs up here. But uh, the, the key idea here is sort of a doubling idea. And, and, and I'm calling it that. I don't know what other people call it. But the idea here is that when I have a bit parallel computer like this, let's assume we got to the point where we've got four bytes, right? 
And those four bytes each contain a partial pop count of, you know, of the thing. So there's, there's four pop counts I want to add up now. What you typically do is you get a pop count for the first byte and you get it in the first byte. And you do the same thing with the second, then the third, then the fourth. And so now I've got all these, these partial pop counts and I need to add them up to get a final answer. Well, there's the obvious way, right, which is to shift it right once and then shift it right once again and blah, blah, blah. No, we can do faster than that because we have parallel. What we actually do is we do start by shifting it right once. So we, we initially have these four pop counts here. Now after we shift it right once and add it together, we have the, um, some garbage that we don't care about anymore on top. And then we have P1 plus P2, and then we have some more garbage that we don't care about in the middle, and then we have P3 plus P4 in the bottom. Okay? So one operation, well, sort of two operations, but one sort of step, and we've combined those two things. And then at the end, and by the way, each of those will now be at most five bits long, right? Because, because they, they count at most um, 16 bits of, you know, 16 one bits, right? And, and so uh, there are a number between 0 and 16, and that will fit in 5 bits. Yeah? So now we're going to get a 6-bit thing where we sort of get the other stuff. Now we just shift it all right 16, and sitting down in the bottom after that is some garbage we don't care about, some garbage we don't care about, some garbage we don't care about, and in the low byte is our sum that we wanted. So it's a two-stage thing that adds up these four things instead of three. Woohoo! Not a very big savings, right? Um, and by the way, then when you're done, you need to mask off all the garbage, right? So that you have only your sum sitting at the bottom. Now this isn't very exciting because this whole thing is a way to go from, you know, to, to go from four partial pop counts to one pop count in four instructions instead of three. And even then, if you start counting masks and stuff, it's kind of a wash. You're like, eh, I'm not very excited about that. The trick, though, is that I can use the same doubling trick to compute these four partial pop counts in the first place. And I can do them all at the same time, right? They're all being done by the same code. And so I just have a stage that, that computes P1, computes P2, computes P3, computes P4, sort of SIMD, sort of bit parallel. Woohoo! And all the algorithms work like that with small tweaks and tricks and stuff. But they all work like that. So. The tricks here is, you know, if you're going to double down in these lower positions, then you've got to be careful or things will overflow into the next positions up. And so you end up using a lot of bit masks to pick out things and make some zeros, make some room so that you can add things in sensible ways. Um, there's a ton of little variants on how you do it. And it turns out there's a, a trick for that final combination that I just showed you that lets you replace all that crud with a single integer multiply. Because the integer multiplies sort of stacks things up and adds them in exactly the way you want. Um, so if you have really scarily fast integer multiply, which most processors do, you might be able to save a little time that way. Woohoo! So those are the ideas. That's, that's our pop count plan. Let's see, somewhere in here, I'm not finding it now, which is a little sad, is a summary of all the algorithms. Oh, that's interesting. My slide disappeared. Okay, that's fine. So the idea behind HackMem 169, which is sort of the original granddaddy of all these, is that we sort of get these things all into things that are um, counts that add up to, that, uh, into a thing that where the counts add up to 63, and then we do this sort, of, this sort of base 63 representation of the final pop count, and then we cast out 63s. And we do that last casting out 63s using an unsigned remainder. Now, if none of that made sense to you, trust me, you can look at the code and it still won't make sense to you. It barely makes sense to me. It's a thing, you know, that clever, clever hackers thought up. And there's a lot of that in this kind of bit banging stuff. Um, it turns out this isn't a very fast way to do it because divide instructions are expensive. You can replace the divide instruction with some synthetic divide that uses shifts and adds. Um, it takes a lot of shifts and adds. It's even more expensive. Um, so this isn't the recommended way. It's a little slower than you'd like it to be. The standard thing to do, oh, sorry. Right, so the standard thing to do is, is what I talked about, just the straight doubling thing. And then 
The other thing you can do it, to get those partial pop counts I showed you earlier, the P1, 2, P3, P4, is I could just look them up in a table. So I can do some pre-computation, make a little 8-bit table of, you know, for every possible 8-bit number, what's its pop count, right? And then I can populate that, that thing from the table and do the addition right at the end. Woohoo! Now tables are cool. Um, and this turns out to be the fastest thing you can do in a micro benchmark. Uh, so the deal is this. Imagine that I have, you know, a table of all the 8-bit numbers and their pop counts, and, or all the 16-bit numbers and their pop counts, even worse, right? There's 64K of those. So now my cache is starting to get polluted, especially on smaller architectures. It's starting to get polluted with this thing, and there's this bad interaction between, you know, this pop count stuff that I have to keep in cache and the actual program you're running that you really want to be able to use the cache because that's the part you care about most of the time. Worse yet, I also have to um, either pre-compute or read in the table, right? And if I pre-compute it, now I've burned tens or hundreds of, you know, thousands, hundreds to hundreds of thousands of instructions, depending on what I'm doing, to actually just build this little pop count table. Better use it a lot of times, because if I don't use it a lot of times, it was completely pointless. If I read it in, I have to touch a disk. Oh my gosh, no, no, there won't be any of that. So while this looks really cool in microbenchmarks, again, microbenchmarks are evil. They mislead you. They tell you to do things that aren't true. And everybody I've read who talks about pop counts says the same thing. Oh yeah, the table-driven stuff's the fastest, and you shouldn't use it. Go microbenchmarking. So... I think I already said most of that. So let's, let's oh, I know, I, I remember why I did this. Right, right, right. This is the point where I actually show you code because, you know, it's not a C code talk until I show you some C code. Um, so this is the micro benchmark framework. When I sat down six or seven years ago to do this, this is the micro benchmark framework I started to write. That's what's up on GitHub. And, you know, so I'm, I'm starting to address in this framework these problems I was talking about. I, it starts with, instead of, um, instead of just always feeding pop count zero, I'm going to feed it, you know, I'm going I'm to make a block of, you know, of random numbers, of a thousand random numbers, and I'm going to sit there and use that block of a thousand random numbers as the thing I run pop count over. I'm going to run it over all those thousand random numbers. That way I have some kind of typical set of inputs. And I store the block in memory because I want all the pop count algorithms to run over the same set of a thousand numbers so that weird anomalies in the input won't, you know, bias so much to favor somebody. Is that enough? No, right? Because, you know, maybe one algorithm really likes having seven be the second number in the block. I don't know. Microbenchmark's hard. But this at least starts to address that problem of what domain do I run the pop count over. Um, the second thing to notice is that the way you construct the driver makes a huge difference. And so this is a style of programming that I'm sure many of you have seen, but it's worth saying something about. Notice that we've got the magic macro here, right? The magic macro actually is a driver that's going to actually do the pop count call, right? And I make one of these per pop count algorithm, right? This is the cool C token pasting stuff. Right? So if I pass the name in here, like uh, naive is one of them things, if I pass naive to this macro, then it makes a, a function called drive naive. Um, and, uh, and that function, you know, if I'm careful to inline pop count naive, which appears right here, then there's no function call overhead, you know, inside the loop. There's no, um, you know, the, the inlining should take care of everything. Everything's run really tightly in this loop. Sort of the optimizer has the chance to do the best thing it can do. And it does that uniformly across the whole thing. And so, you know, this is a write once, you know, use for everything little driver framework. It's a great example of generating C code from a macro. Um, I'm not a big fan of generating C code from a macro in general. This is micro benchmarking drives you to these things. Normally I would say, no, 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 this should be an inline function and, you know, but, but I don't want to pass a function pointer into an inline function because I'm not quite sure what the optimizer will do with it, right? Here I'm quite sure what the optimizer will do because it's smart enough to actually inline calls that are made statically like that. So I'm generating code from a macro. Woohoo! Good thing to do. And notice that I'm also really careful now to use the result of the pop count. Um, so that, so that of each pop count, so that the optimizer can't optimize this away. I don't think there are any optimizers clever enough to 
notice that I'm doing pop count and pre-predict pre what the sum of all those pop counts should be and store it in here and avoid the loop. I don't think there are any of those. If there are, well, good for them. But, uh, but I think I've got it to the point where I really am pretty confident that this count, this pop count is being called however many times I asked it to be called. So I at least have that going for me. Yeah? Uh, what's the XOR of results? Um, is that just part of? Again, Okay, so that, you're right, subtle bug. So uh, when I first did this, um, yeah, I, I want to make sure that there's no question that this thing's going to pull this thing out of the, out of the memory and, and actually build the argument in some sensible way. You know, I, again, I'm trying to control the optimizer and keep it from doing clever things. If I don't do this, if I just XOR with random sub i, well, I remember what was happening. So yeah, there was this one benchmark that ran anomalously, crazily fast. And none of us, you know, and finally some guy called me on it on the internets and he said, hey, you know, this one thing runs faster than it has any right to. What's going on? So my cartel, my friend who used to design CPUs for AMD and Intel, um, sat down with me and we start working through it and we start looking at the assembly code and all of a sudden we realize it's full of SSE instructions. Because GCC is really, really smart. It's like, you know what? These arguments don't have anything to do with each other. I'll just pull four of them at a time and do them in a single SSE instruction. Woohoo! Made it go a lot faster. <laughs> so now I have to be really careful to make sure that, that each argument depends on the previous result. And now it can't do that anymore. It can't do, start the next pop count until it's finished the previous one. So you got to be careful, or weird things happen for sure. Yeah. But I mean, I mean you're mixing it like this. I don't run the risk of, of just making a bad choice in the systemic way that you choose to mix it. I mean, that, to me, that seems like I, all, all I wanted was a mixing function that was fast and gave good mixing. And if you're a crypto guy, I think you're happy with XOR as a function that's fast and gives good mixing. Probably, Jason, you, you, will you will you confirm my choice of mixing functions? Where's Jason? Oh, did he take off? That's cool. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're right. You, you know, maybe I'm causing some problem. If this were an expensive function, I would be unhappy, right? Because you know, now all of a sudden I'm paying. I may be bench, micro benching, not pop count, but this thing, right? I'm already micro benching partly the fetch from my block. I'm hoping the whole thing's in L1 cache and that it's all fast. I don't know. Micro benchmarks are hard to get right. This is a half-assed first cut that I just used to try and get some idea of what's going on, and it's been good enough that I've never gotten away from it, but there we are. So, yeah, what else did I want to say? Right, right. So, um, and so, you know, that, that begs a question, too, which is, okay, fine, so it was using SSE some of the time. Maybe that's okay, right? I happen to have an SSE unit, right? Remember, my original goal was something that would be portably fast. And so I really wanted to make it stop using SSE. But that's part of what you got to figure out is what do you want to let your compiler do? It will do all kinds of things for you. <laughs> what do you want to let it do? And so here I decided I didn't want to let it do that because I thought probably my code would eventually run on a lot of machines that didn't have an SSE or equivalent unit in it. Uh, Altivec or whatever, whatever uh, AMD is calling it. All right. Daniel, is, is that hand waving back there because I'm almost out of time or? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. I, just, I don't want to bore people or, or run us out of time here. Of That's cool. All right. <laughs> it all works. It all works. So here's, here's, here's the benchmarks that I actually wrote. Um, I say wrote. I mean, most of them you'll see credit for, you know, many of them you'll see credit for who I actually took it from because I'm not claiming I'm clever enough to write all this stuff myself. Here's the naive one, which looks just like the code that we uh, saw on the slide, except it gets the types right, and except I broke it out into separate statements, which for a modern compiler makes no difference whatsoever. Um, oh, I guess I'm also being really careful in this one to shift it right only by one so that machines without fast barrel shifters will still not lose. So yeah, whatever. Um, here's, some, here's some bit parallelism. This is probably the simplest one where I just add up those four subsums we were talking about earlier and then do the combining steps at the end and off I go. Um, that's faster. Here's more bit parallelism where I do it only six bits at a time. Okay, congratulations. Oops, sorry. I'll figure out how to run my computer someday. Um, here's some more variants on these schemes. 
where I've unrolled those loops that you saw earlier. I tried that just this morning because I was like, well, maybe if I unroll the loops, the compiler will be happier. Nope, turns out it makes a tiny difference sometimes, but it's not interesting. Um, here's HackMem 169. Like I say, if you can explain to me in clear, coherent English in five minutes how this works, I'll be very impressed. Um, it does a thing, and then at the end there's a mod 63. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, like I say, it's, it's, it's sort of casting out 63s, and I think I kind of vaguely understand how it works, but... but uh. um, here, if you don't want to use the mod 63, um, is a way to get mod 63 um, that was invented by this guy and posted on the internet. And I think the comment that came with it in Hacker's Delight is, this other guy I think has a proof of that it works. I don't know anybody who knows how that thing works. It's like, oh, I don't know. It computes mod 63, honest. And uh, so I can use that instead to make it go faster or slower. It turns out slower. Um, here's another variant on HackMem that goes even slower yet. Um, tried that this morning when I found it in somewhere. And I'm like, oh, maybe that one's faster. Nope. Um, and then there's more of these divide and conquer algorithms. And it turns out that these are the sort of things. This is sort of the one that you'll see the most. This one, as you see, is stolen from Wikipedia. Um, but I, I've written it myself probably five, six times in my life because it's really easy to understand how to write it and how it works. Um, and it's pretty fast. And you'll notice that, you know, for most of these, I actually went through and sort of did an analysis based on my guesses about how an Intel CPU works and how the compiler works of sort of what it would turn into. Those analyses turned out to be somewhat helpful, but mostly wrong. Um, and in fact, um, my cartel, again, my CPU friend, sat down with me and sort of showed me what was really going on in a lot of those cases. It also turns out that that was on the CPUs of five years ago, oh no, which were terrible at some things that now the modern CPUs are good at. It looks like my analyses work a lot better on my Haswell machine I have on my desk now. So go figure. Because the CPU's gotten a lot clever about analyzing code. You don't think of the CPU as analyzing your code, but it does, of course. On a modern Intel CPU, you know, the compiler chews it all up and generates the best assembly code it can. But one of the reasons that it's so hard for the compiler to do that is now the CPU is going to chew it up dynamically as it comes in. Oh, look, a bunch of instructions. Let's see if we can optimize what we're doing here. So it can be really hard to guess what's going to be fastest. So, and then the other ones I wanted to show you, like I say, you can replace that final stage with a multiply. Sorry about the wrap there. Let's see if I can make that go away. Um, nope, I can't. <laughs> Question asked and answered. Let's see. There we go. Um, and uh, the rest of this is all just, oh, I'm sorry, there's some table-driven stuff too. Um, you'll notice that the, for the table-driven stuff, I actually pre-compute the table with a program written in another language entirely, our nickel programming language, because I can. And so if you look at pop count table, .c, top table 8 c it's an uninteresting piece of C code. I don't, for the life of me, remember why I pound included this instead of, instead of uh, linking with it like a sensible person would, but I'm sure there was some deep and sufficient reason. I guess it was probably that I was afraid of linker over, possible linker overheads when it's, you know, because the references to this table are going to be in the inner loop. I don't want anything that could possibly get in the way of being able to make them fast. Um, so for 150, for the, in, for the number 155, the pop count turns out to be five. Woo -hoo. Um, so then you do this table-driven table pop count. There's the 16-bit version. There's an 8-bit version right up there somewhere that looks just like you think it would. Here's the nice table of drivers. And one of the reasons, the reason that I have, as well as the driver function, I have a pointer to the function itself, is because one of the things, if you'll remember back when, by the way, this is how I initialize my block of random numbers. You'll notice I'm being sort of extra with the random numbers because I don't care, it's not in the inner loop. And because random number generators, not so good. Um, the random in particular, I'm suspicious of it, both its high and low order bits, and so I'm trying to spread around. I'm, by using several random numbers and XORing them together, I'm trying to spread it around so that there are good bits sitting almost every place. I don't think it matters in this situation at all, but why find out, right? No point in doing the wrong thing. Um, 
And then, oh, and then the next interesting piece of code, maybe, if you care about this kind of thing, is this is, you know, there again, there are macros lying around that you can try to figure out how to use or whatever. This is how you subtract, this is how I subtracted struct time vals, which is a little bit of a pain in the neck because struct time vals is a terrible archaic data structure that arguably should no longer exist. It should be replaced with 16 bit nanoseconds, or sorry, 64 bit nanoseconds, and we should call it a day, but it isn't yet. So you get to do time vowel subtraction. Woohoo! Um, and that's important because I want to be able to find out how long things ran without using my stopwatch because the stopwatch is uh, an obvious source of error. There is. If you go dig it out and figure out how to use it, I'm not sure what's better. Again, I was worried about portability of the benchmark suite to things like ARMS and stuff like that that weren't even necessarily running Unix, so I included my own. But on the other hand, why am I taking a struct time valve if I'm running on something else? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying this code's perfect, let's put it that way. <laughs> and the other thing I was going to say is I also built some test cases, because I'm a good test-driven developer like everybody else. The test cases are automatically run um, every time you start this thing up. So that problem I mentioned a long time ago, you've forgotten about that problem by now, haven't you? Where you benchmark the thing and it's like, woohoo, epically fast except wrong answers. Can't happen. It will sit there and notice in the, in the test case phase. Well, can't happen, such a strong word. I only taste, test a dozen cases, but it's unlikely to happen because one of my test cases is likely to fail and then it just knocks that benchmark out. It's like, I won't run that one, it doesn't work, which is what it should do. Okay, and so now down here, and honest, I think it's worth working through this code. This is the last of the interesting code, really. Um, notice this thing that says preheat here, where I just, run this thing 5,000 times for no apparent reason. That is all about that thing I talked about with the environment. I want the caches to be in a known state. I want the registers to be loaded up with whatever they're supposed to be ready with. I want this thing to be running sort of from the best possible place it can be. I want the branch predictors to all be predicting the right way, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm just going to run it a bunch of times before I start to get it going. And now, let's quit poking at code. I don't know what I'm doing here. Apparently it's making the lights very happy. Um, I'm just going to run the drivers and I'm done. Blah, 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 blah. So that's the whole code. That's the benchmark code. And the reason I show you that whole pile of code is that, um, and you know, I said some of those things. Um, the reason I show you that whole pile of code is that I want you to see that, first of all, it wasn't an epic pile of code. You know, this is only a few hundred lines outside of the benchmarks themselves. Not even that. I think the whole thing's 150 lines or something. So it's like 50 lines outside of the benchmarks themselves. But at each stage in building it, I was pretty careful about what I was doing so that I could try to get any validity at all out of this whole process. And a lot of times that was the result of mistakes. I did run benchmarks where I was getting wrong answers. I did run benchmarks that the optimizer was doing very clever things with. I told you about that. And so every time I discover one of these bugs, I'm like, dang it, I knew I should have thought about that. Let me get it out again. Now I could have gone and got a micro benchmark framework off the web. There's lots of them. You can go find one under pretty much every rock. The problem is now, instead of the problem of getting my, my own micro benchmarks right, I have the problem of understanding how to use somebody else's package correctly. You know me, I'm a geek. I'm like, I'd, I'd prefer the uh, first problem to the second problem because then at least when it fails, I might have some chance of understanding what I did wrong. Um, but that's a matter of taste. And I, don't, I certainly like those frameworks. Let's run all this um, because, you know, we can't go this far without actually running something. Um, whoops. Let's pretend we hadn't made it already. You'll notice that I'm using WL because I'm a sensible. I'm using 04 and I'm using the flags that I think go with the processor that I have to try to get things optimized. It turns out it doesn't make very much difference. GCC doesn't do anything much different if I get rid of that flag and just use 04. 04, by the way, is way better than 03, which is way better than 02 and so forth, which is interesting. I was surprised by that, actually. How so much better is, is 04 over 03? <sighs> Depends on the thing. We'll run it both ways and check. I really don't remember. <laughs> It depends on the benchmark, obviously. Nothing's way better on the naive one because it's so slow and there's so little that can be done with it. But on the other ones, it tends to be better. So let's run this. And by the way, um, just to emphasize the point that you don't have to be too clever here. Ideally, you would do this thing you do in your micro benchmarking where we run a few iterations to find out how fast it's going to go and then you know, from that compute how many iterations to run for the real thing. 
I'm lazy. I didn't do that. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to run, um, a hundred thousand iterations for this demo. Um, and I happen to know that that's about the right number. So, um, that was pretty lame. The one thing I did do is for pop count naive, I actually divide that time by, um, a factor of eight because it's about eight times slower than anything else. And so that way you don't just spend the whole time waiting for the naive one to finish. Um, but then when I'm done, I give all the results in nanoseconds so they're consistent. And you start to see what's going on here, right? The naive pop count, you know, 30 nanoseconds. 30 nanoseconds per iteration. Um, and then these other ones start to be, you know, sort of in the 10 nanosecond range for the HackMem ones, um, which is, you know, four, three, four times faster. That's good. And now you start to see the, um, the ones that start to do divide and conquer. There's some six nanosecond ones. Um, the rest of them are going to be five nanosecond-ish. Um, well, after these, those are terrible. Those are the ones I was talking about that are unrolled. And you see the unrolling makes a tiny difference. That's actually repeatable, but it's also actually that tiny, so who cares? Um, and, then, um, and then, yeah, like I say, 5.79 for pop count four, which is probably as fast as it's going to get, by the way, um, for anything except the table-driven ones. Um, so, you know, we're talking about 5.6 nanoseconds. Think about that for a moment. That's pretty cool, right? 5.6 nanoseconds. Those aren't microseconds or milliseconds. That's like, you know, your clock on this machine, this machine has, I think, a, is a 1.8 gigahertz machine that's double pumped on the ALU, so it's effectively 3.6 gigahertz, which means that, you know, it's several hundred picoseconds per instruction. Um, for the simplest, fastest instructions that don't touch anything, don't do anything. And so now you start to see why people aren't so concerned about providing pop count. If, um, if, if, if uh, 5.8 nanoseconds per iteration isn't good enough for you, then you probably have something else going on that's weird. But you'll notice that the table-driven ones, if you really must go there, the, the multiply makes a little positive difference on this machine. It actually doesn't help on my Haswell machine, by the way. This is Ivy Bridge. And between Ivy Bridge and Haswell, they apparently made everything else faster enough that the multiply doesn't buy you anything anymore. Um, and uh, the tabular ones are consistently about a nanosecond faster. Um, you'll notice here that the 16-bit one actually gets slower again, which is interesting. Why? Because, you know, apparently 16-bit table looks, lookups are expensive on this machine. Shrug. On my Haswell machine, on my older Core 2 Duo, they're about the same. So what conclusions should we draw from this table? There's lots we can. I think the one we should is that you should use one of these things. Because, you know, in particular, the plain old pop count two is probably your best choice. It's documented in Wikipedia. It's plenty fast. It's almost as fast as anything out there. It's very portable. It runs on any dang thing. Um, everybody understands how it works. Um, that's the most conclusion I would probably want to draw from this. Um, believe me, if, if, if this were, say, a graphic card performance and you were looking online, people would draw lots more conclusions than that. <laughs> oh, the other thing you should, conclusion you can draw is you should never use pop count naive if you care about performance. You should never use not, pop count naive if you care about performance. Um, so somebody asked, I'll let this run while we're doing other stuff. Um, somebody asked what happens if I change the flags. Um, Uh, we'll get rid of the machine architecture flags. We'll turn it back to 03. Um, and then we'll run it. We'll run it the fast way now. We'll take a zero off. It doesn't actually make much difference to the precision. Uh, there again, you know, who's obsessing about the precision details of these things? Nobody should be. It just doesn't matter that much. If you run this only 100 times, you'll get really bad numbers. After that, it starts to get pretty good. Um, it's all about the clock granularity, really, by the way. It's that, you know, that the system, the wall clock is only accurate to, I don't know, a millisecond or something. So you need to run it long enough that that'll have some time to do something. Yeah. Uh, when you compile, how come you're not using uh, March equals native? Um, because I didn't. I don't know. Um, I used MArch equals what I thought was native, and you're right. I can probably say MArch equals native, and the right thing will happen. I I just hadn't thought of it because that's a pretty new thing. It doesn't really matter. You can uh, the for the machines I picked, I think I've got the right arch, arch setting. But you're right. I should have done that. Um, 
anyway, for here, if, you, if we cut it back, you'll notice that actually for these, it didn't, it didn't change much at all. On my Haswell machine, it makes some difference on these. Um, the only ones that changed are, strangely, I think pop count four might have, yeah, I think they're about the same. Pop count four is sort of consistently the fastest for me these days on modern Intel processors. That means exactly nothing except something about modern Intel processors. Yeah? You run it with zero optimization? Yeah, of course. Yeah, if we run it for debugging, um, something different will happen. Yep. Um, in fact, I'll turn on dash G just to make sure that it's not optimizing anything because if there's any way to stop it, it's to use minus G. Slower. <laughs> now we're up to 100 seconds. And the other thing you're going to see with that, I suspect, is that you know, we're not going to see the same kind of behaviors quite. So maybe we will. I don't know. I don't know. The un Notice how the unrolled does a lot better now relative to the not unrolled. Ha, huh, who would have thought? Because now the compiler isn't automatically unrolling all the other stuff anyway. So <laughs> my, my manual unrolling actually did something. So that's a good example of where you can get fooled if you don't let the optimizer do its job is that, you know, it might lead you to conclude that, woohoo, unrolling, it's the future. And, you know, if you watch C programmers, of a certain stripe. I'm sure no one in this room is like that. They spend a lot of time unrolling loops and getting things in the right. Ah, I'm so sure I micro my micro optimizations will make it faster. And those of us who know modern C compilers just laugh our asses off because no, you don't have any idea what the compiler is going to do, and you don't have any idea what effect your changes are going to have on the compiler except by running the compiler. <laughs> uh, what version of GCC are you using? Uh, good question. Uh, I think it's I think it's the latest. I know on the Haswell stuff I was using the well, not the latest. I was using 4.8. I think. Um, I don't know what I'm using on here. 4.8. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's modern. It's not. There is a 4.9 out, but um, this is sort of the latest version that Debian ships and seems good enough. And you're right. That's the kind of stuff when you're recording these these micro benchmarks. You know, it would be nice if you would write down things like, you know, what's what's your CPU, what's your machine, what's your um, compiler, so that people can later try to reproduce your results or at least understand them. Um, you know, this is a really useful file if you're running Linux. Um, is this one called Proc CPU Info that tells you all about your CPU and what it is? Um, you know, some of that output should probably be captured when you're <laughs> when you're uh, reporting your little micro benchmarks to some. Have you tried any of these on AMD processors? I haven't. I really I haven't tried them on much of anything except the Intel parts I've had been lying around. Intel's been very generous about you know, getting me machines at various times and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm kind of tied to the Intel hardware by some kind of golden handcuffs. But, you know, it'd be really interesting to try my name. Do you, like I say, I'd be even more interested to try them on a modern uh, ARM because, you know, more and more that code is being run on modern ARMs. And I suspect the results might be, yeah, 40 bucks. And it's, you know, the, the, one, that, the, the one that I'm playing with has a four-way um, vector floating point unit. And it. it's like, okay, it's probably fast enough to do real things with. But uh, you know, it'd be really interesting to see whether these conclusions hold up there. My suspicion is that they will. You know, my suspicion is that I'm not going to have any big surprises here. My suspicion is that table-driven is going to be relatively faster than it is on these machines because, um, because there's less optimization of the non-table-driven code um, inside the CPU. And that's just a guess. I'd really have to run it to find out. Um, the yeah, so I mean, these are the things that I found out. By the way, why am I using wall clock time? I expected somebody to ask me, why are you using wall clock time of all things? Because ultimately, that's probably what I care about, right? Um, there's, a, you know, there's a sort of a tendency in these micro benchmarking to use CPU time or to use system time or some combination of CPU and system time. And that's very tempting. The problem is that on modern operating systems, it's really hard for the operating system to do accurate accounting. And so now you're trusting not only the accuracy of your benchmark, you're trusting the accuracy of the sort of CPU's accounting of what belonged to what. For example, when your machine is stalled waiting for memory to read, who gets that time? Is it credited to the CPU? Is it credited to the system? Is it credited to the wall clock and to neither of the others? I don't know, right? And I suppose for Linux I can look it up. But on arbitrary random operating systems, I certainly don't know. So I'm just going to use wall clock time because at the end of the day, I care about the wall clock. Yeah. We also got bit pretty hard with the uh, multi-core. Mm -hmm. If you don't, be careful with your source of time. You can actually be subtracting the wrong. 
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Locking it down to a single core would probably be really good practice. I hadn't thought about it, but for this, because I don't think it's going to do anything on a different core. But but for you know, but for situations where it might, because it's something heftier, then yeah, absolutely. You should probably start by. I should probably have in my code a little thing, a Linux specific thing that locks it down to a particular CPU, which is easy to do if you just remember to do it. So much of the micro benchmarking that screws you up is that is, oh, this this thing that I should have been able to think of, and it would have been easy to do if I'd thought of it, but I didn't, and I only discover it three weeks of trying to understand why my benchmarks are so weird later. Um, that's pretty much the standard story. Um, so if you want the take home lessons from this talk, I guess it's that micro benchmarks are evil and easy to screw them up. Don't do them. And if you do do them, don't place too much weight on any but the grossest of conclusions from them. And uh, bit parallelism, on the other hand, is really, really cool. And C is a, one of C's strengths is it makes you have access to the bit parallelism in the machine really, really easily. And so learning to bit bang, going out and buying a copy of uh, Hacker's Delight and learning to bit bang is a really worthwhile thing if you really are looking for performance. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much what I had to say. Any other questions or comments? Cool. It's fun. I'll be around to talk afterwards. <laughs>